She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signals in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another coffee and crime time. So before I dive into the description of the case we're talking about today, I do want to address that my recording space is different. Um, everything's a little bit different right now in the basement where my recording booth usually is. We're doing some work, there was some water damage and I had to sort of shift and find a new place to record very quickly. And as you see, with the sun on me, trust me, it's not any better when I close the blinds. It just looks creepier. I'm going to have to figure out when the best times to record in this space are for the next few weeks. But we're going to make the best of it and we're going to ignore the sun on me. And as the sun does, it's going to go down as we're talking. So it's going to become a less noticeable. But just bear with me. Also, there's a little fly in here that is stuck in the blinds. And he sometimes makes a noise and buzzes and then like slams himself into the window. So if you hear that, um, just ignore it and bear with me for now. <laughs> We're going to do the best that we can. So today's case brings us to Florida, where 33-year-old Microsoft executive and father of four, Jared Breidigan, was ambushed and murdered in the street on the evening of February 16th, 2022 right in front of his two-year-old daughter. Now, recently, three arrests have been made in this case, and one of the people arrested and charged with Jared's murder is his ex-wife, Shayna Gardiner, along with her current husband, Mario Fernandez. So this is a developing case, and Shayna has retained high-profile criminal defense attorney, Jose Baez, so you know you just know. The entire trial is going to be a circus. It's already started. But today we're going to talk about the details of the case that we know so far. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Helix Sleep. Today's video is sponsored by Helix Sleep and their best sale of the year is running now. So it's the perfect time to take that leap if you've been wanting to upgrade your mattress. And normally, I don't encourage taking leaps, but if you're going to take a leap and if it's going to be onto a Helix Sleep mattress, I endorse that decision. Helix Sleep matches you to the perfect mattress that's based on your body type and sleep preferences, and it's customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped to your door. Everybody and everybody is different, and Helix knows that, which is why they've made a sleep quiz asking about your ideal firmness preference as far as the mattress goes, as well as your ideal sleep positions. And if you sleep with a partner, you can take the quiz together and find something that will suit both of you, a compromise. Or you can just take it yourself and then have it delivered right to your front door, all wrapped up convenient, all easy to unfurl and put on your bed and then just tell your partner, this is what we got. It's amazing. You're going to love it. And it's exactly matched to my sleep preferences. For instance, I'm a side sleeper and I like a firmer mattress. I like to feel that my bed has my back since I'm going to be laying there all unconscious and vulnerable throughout the night. And Helix does have my back because they matched me with their Midnight Luxe mattress. And let me tell you, I've gotten the best sleep of my life on this mattress. I no longer toss and turn all night, just trying to get comfortable. I no longer wake up the next day absolutely exhausted because I never did get comfortable. And you know how it would be, right? Like falling asleep at night, you're trying to find a position that you can actually fall asleep in and then all night, you find yourself waking up uncomfortable again and shifting positions again. And I remember those days because most mornings I woke up 
just feeling sore, exhausted, like I didn't sleep at all. And now most mornings I wake up in the same position I fell asleep in. I feel well rested and free of the aches and pains that would greet me every morning with my old mattresses. I've been sleeping on my Helix mattress for a few years now and I'll never go back. I love the hybrid design that they have in their mattresses, which combines memory foam and springs. I love that it showed up at my door all rolled up in a box, how easy it was to unpack and get on my bed, just how easy the entire process is from taking the quiz to getting matched with your perfect mattress to having it arrive at your front door to then, you know, unboxing it, seeing it unfurl and get bigger, which is super cool. Just placing it on your bed wherever you're going to have it and then literally that night you're having the best sleep ever. And unlike other brands that use fiberglass as a flame retardant in their mattresses, Helix mattresses do not contain fiberglass. And as you know, fiberglass can cause some health issues. I mean, it makes sense. It's not something that it sounds like I want to be sleeping on. And you can personalize your new Helix mattress even more by adding their Glacio Tech cooling cover. It's going to keep you cool and comfortable while you sleep. Some people like to have it in the summer. I like to have it all the time because the best temperature for sleeping is always going to be a little cooler. That's what your body wants. And the best part is Helix is going to send your mattress to you with free shipping in the US. And they're offering you a 100 night sleep trial. That means you can bring the mattress into your house, sleep on it for 100 nights, and you can really get a feel for your new mattress and make sure it's a good fit for you and for your life. Plus, Helix mattresses have a 10 year warranty and they even offer financing options and flexible payment plans. So a great night's sleep is not far away. I love my Helix mattress. All of my kids have Helix mattresses. My dogs love the Helix mattress. I know they do because they're on my bed every night, all three of them. And even though I'm scrunched between my husband, my dogs, and sometimes my kids, I'm still getting great sleep on my Helix mattress, so I know you'll love yours as well. And right now, during their best sale of the year, this is a very, very good deal, probably the best one I've ever seen Helix offer. They're offering you 25% off a Helix sleep mattress plus a free sleep bundle. So you're gonna wanna click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash harlow to find out more about this limited time offer. And like I said, it's a limited time offer. It's going to end soon, so don't miss out. Click the link in the description box or go to helixsleep.com slash harlow to Take advantage now and get 25% off your Helix mattress as well as a free sleep bundle. Thank you so much to Helix for sponsoring today's video. Let's dive in. Okay, so on the evening of February 16th, 2022, Jared Bridegan took his nine-year-old twins, Liam and Abby, to dinner along with their half-sister, two-year-old Bexley. Now, he dropped the older children off to their mother, Shanna Gardner, in Jacksonville Beach before heading to his home in St. Augustine. But first, he stopped to get two-year-old Bexley an ice cream. Jared's current wife, Kirsten Bridegan, said that she decided to stay home that night with their six-month-old daughter, London. But Jared called her to tell her that he loved her and that they were almost home. And Kirsten said, quote, I was on the phone with one of my brothers and Jared called in while we were talking. So I added him and the three of us were chatting for a minute and then my brother dropped off so I could just be talking to Jared and Bexley who told me, mom, I got an ice cream, end quote. Now Jared would normally have been home by 8.15 p.m. And so when 8.30 arrived and he had not pulled into their driveway yet, Kirsten became worried and started calling his cell phone, but he didn't answer. Eventually someone did pick up the phone, but it wasn't Jared it was a police officer with the Jacksonville Beach Police Department, and Kirsten was told that her daughter Bexley was okay, but they needed her to come into the station. And it was there at the Jacksonville Beach Police Station that Kirsten Bridegan was informed her husband had been shot to death on a dark road just over two miles from the home of his ex-wife where he had dropped off his son and daughter around 7.15 p.m. Police believe that on a dark stretch of Sanctuary Boulevard, Jared encountered a tire blocking the road. And when he opened his door to move the tire, he was shot several times at close range. Police say he was the victim of a targeted attack on a one-way road. He traveled often. Jared came across a tire police say was intentionally placed right here in the middle of the road in the sanctuary neighborhood of Jacksonville Beach, Florida. That's when someone came out of these woods and ambushed the father of four, killing him on the spot. So basically they're saying this is the perfect spot to ambush somebody. One of the commenters I saw who was talking about this case 
who was ex-military, he called it a choke point, basically a place where it's one way, there's a lot of trees and stuff on the side, so you can't kind of pull off the road and go around this tire in the middle of the road. You're going to have to get out of your vehicle and move the tire. Now, obviously, it's too late for Jared, but especially for women, if you see something like that in the middle of the road, do not get out of your vehicle and move it yourself call the police because that is oftentimes, you know, or can be an ambush on you. Um, It happened to me once. It wasn't a tire. It was somebody who pretended their car was broken down in the middle of the road. They had pulled completely, you know, like sideways in the road. Their hood was up, but it just didn't feel right. So I called the police and then I sort of like put myself in reverse because there was no place to turn around. That's another benefit of the choke point for anybody who wants to ambush you. There's no place to really turn around. Like you can't do a U-turn. You're just, it's forward or nothing. And I kind of put it in reverse and I just waited until I found a driveway I could pull around in and then the police came. Now, don't get out of your car to move something in the road. But obviously, like I said, Jared would have no idea. He doesn't think he's a target for anybody or anything right now. He's just thinking, trying to get my two-year-old daughter home. It's her bedtime. I got to get this tire out of the car. He wasn't thinking, why would this tire be in the middle of the road? So we have Jared shot dead in the road. His daughter, Bexley, is strapped into her car seat in the back seat. And luckily, it wasn't long before a passerby found Jared's Volkswagen Atlas just three minutes later. So Bexley was safe. She'd only been sitting there for three minutes, but that's still a long time, right, after what she witnessed and the fact that she saw her father go down and when she was calling for him, he wasn't answering. That three minutes probably felt like three lifetimes for little Bexley. And even though she's safe and strapped into the car seat when she's found, bullets had been shot into the SUV near where she was sitting. They could have hit her. She could have been not safe. She could have been harmed. So when police arrived, they found the emergency lights of Jared's vehicle were flashing and that tire was still in the middle of the road and Jared was lying next to his open driver's side door. However, the assailant, along with the murder weapon, were nowhere to be found. And almost immediately, Jared's ex-wife, Shayna, came under scrutiny, especially when it began to be revealed through the media that the couple had gone through a very contentious divorce and custody battle seven years prior. And I mean, the divorce had been seven years prior, but the issues as well as tensions between Jared and Shanna, they had continued to rise. And this was causing conflict between them as well as between um, themselves and their new spouses. So Shayna Gardner, she was born into a wealthy Mormon family. Shayna's parents, Sterling and Shelley Gardner, founded Stampin' Up. This is a Riverton, Utah-based company. They sell like products for arts and crafts, greeting cards, scrapbooking supplies, home decor, you know, cutesy like Pinterest stuff. And Shanna had grown up very well off. You know, her parents ran and owned and operated a multi-million dollar company. So she grew up with a silver spoon in her mouth. And she had traveled to Florida in 2009, at which point she was introduced to Jared Bridegan through the wife of Jared's brother, Adam. And apparently, Adam's wife had known Shanna for years. They'd been close when they were younger. And I'm not sure if Shanna was there specifically to see Adam's wife in Florida or if she was just there on vacation and caught up with Adam's wife while she was there. But either way, somehow Shanna found herself being introduced to Jared Bridegan. And as is the Mormon way, it was a very fast courtship. The following year, Shayna and Jared were married in Utah, and then they moved to Connecticut. And that's where they were living for a little bit. And at first, allegedly, the marriage between Shanna and Jared, who was also a member of the LDS church, it seemed loving and happy. But after the birth of their twins, Liam and Abby, the family had to move to Jared's hometown of Jacksonville Beach because Liam had a heart condition that required him to live at sea level. And it seemed that it was in Florida where the marriage began to deteriorate. But honestly, according to some friends of Shanna and Jared, there had always been a weird power dynamic in the relationship. And people felt that Shanna had used the promise of her parents' $100 million business to lure Jared in. 
a friend, a mutual friend, who I believe wanted to remain anonymous because their name wasn't printed, they said, quote, it was like she was saying, look at what my lifestyle is. I can fly you all over. My parents pay for everything, end quote. And this honestly does make sense. It makes sense that Shanna would try to use that. It makes sense that Jared might allow her to paint this like beautiful, colorful picture about this life of luxury that they were going to live. It's nice to think like, oh, here's somebody that I get along with who I'm attracted to and they come from money, like score, right? So I get it on both ends. But according to records, Shanna's parents allegedly were financially supporting the couple. They were giving them a stipend of over $8,000 a month. And in 2020, Shanna started a company called Beach Baked 904, which honestly, I'm sure her parents funded. But that's just my opinion, allegedly. Don't come for me. But they definitely did, right? Definitely. I am a home-based bakery. I work under Cottage Law. And it initially started off as a hobby and something that I hoped would pay for itself. And it turned into a business and I couldn't be happier about it. This has been my passion since I was a child and it's allowed me to be flexible with my hours so I could be with my kids more. And that was really the goal. I am a custom bakery, so I do anything and everything that people ask me to or can come up with uh, that's within my skill set or wheelhouse. When it came down to it, this came about and this is possible through what started with cooking with my grandma in the kitchen. And then it turned into a labor of love and a way to show people that we care about them and to kind of share happiness, make people happy. Everyone's happy right. when they get little treats and when they get food. Apparently, the bride again marriage began to have issues in 2014, and in 2015, Shanna filed for divorce, telling the judge that the reason she was doing this was because she and Jared simply did not love each other anymore. However, according to Jared, Shanna had been having an affair with her personal trainer, who she'd met after Jared had given her a package of training sessions for Christmas in 2014. Now, I'm sure she asked for this, but don't don't give your wife or girlfriend personal training sessions for Christmas. Maybe she did ask for it. Maybe she was like, I want to get healthy and fit again. Maybe. But I, I don't want my husband or my partner to give me personal training sessions because now you're telling me you want me to lose weight. And I don't like that. I want to be the one to want to lose weight. And I'm not saying anything bad about Jared. It's just a quick tip for the men out there watching because Christmas is right around the corner. So Shanna's denied that she had an affair, but the personal trainer in question has since come forward and stated that, yeah, they, they did have a relationship. He said that after they were seeing each other in a professional setting for a few weeks, the relationship between himself and Shanna had become romantic and physical. But she told him that she and her husband were already going through a separation. This man who obviously wants to remain anonymous, he said, quote, they weren't really speaking. They were living on opposite ends of the house. She said she had grown up Mormon and didn't want that anymore, end quote. And it seems that this does have some truth to it, that Shanna was maybe feeling a little bit like she wanted to rebel, like she wanted to push back against her traditional and conservative background. Right around the time she filed for divorce, she started getting piercings, she started getting tattoos, I think she cut her hair, kind of just started looking edgier and things like that. And we're going to hear from a friend of hers who can, you know, attest, attest to this change in her. Because when he met her, he said she looked just like a regular, you know, 30 something mom. And then as he knew her for a few weeks and months, this transformation overcame her. Now, this personal trainer dude, he claims that he and Shanna only saw each other for a few months. And then things, you know, with her breakup, her breakup between herself and her husband, and just her life became so difficult and whatever they had fizzled out or stopped. Now, Jared's family claims this isn't true. Shanna and Jared were not separated at the time that she started seeing this personal trainer. They only became separated shortly before Shanna filed 
filed for divorce on February 23rd, 2015, and it was only after Jared discovered sexually explicit messages that were exchanged between his wife and her personal trainer. And according to everyone who knew Jared, he was willing to like look past this and to forgive her for the sake of their family and their kids and, you know, try to figure out a way to forgive each other and move on. But that did not seem to be what Shayna wanted. She wanted out. She was done, which is absolutely fine. You know, I'm, I'm not saying anything about that. Like, things happen between spouses. There's infidelity. There's a loss of trust. There's a whole bunch of things that can happen. And one person might say, like, I'm in this forever. I really want to work this out. And the other person might be like, mentally, I, I can't. Mentally and emotionally, I'm done. I cannot do it because I don't see a way forward. And that's absolutely fine. There is nothing wrong with getting divorced. There's nothing illegal about getting divorced if one or both partners are are done. And yeah, there's going to be hurt feelings. And if there's kids involved, it becomes difficult. But it can be done in a healthy and non-toxic way. That did not happen in this divorce, but it can be done. Now, according to Jared's close friend, Mallory Boudin, Jared was the last person to have enemies. And she refers to him as her first love. She met him through the LDS church while they were in high school. And she said... You know, he was amazing. All her memories of Jared are filled with laughter and light. And even though it didn't end up working out and they split and they ended up moving and living 45 minutes away from each other, she and Jared remained close. She said, quote, he wasn't like other guys that I knew in high school. He was very respectful. He was a true gentleman, end quote. And apparently Jared had even become friends with Mallory's husband. You know, it was a very platonic relationship. But in 2015, Jared sent Mallory some Facebook messages and he gave her some insight into what was happening in his life and in his marriage. He also sent her some emails and one email said, quote, in the past three months, Shayna has become really distant and got emotionally attached to her personal trainer at the gym and is now divorcing me, but she has her agency, so I just need to move on and find someone to be my best friend again, you know, end quote. Oh my God, that's so sad. Oh, find someone to be my best friend again. And here's the thing. We just talked about a case where a man from the LDS church murdered his wife because he couldn't stand the thought of her leaving him. He didn't see her as having her own agency. And here is an LDS man who is devoutly Mormon, right? And he's saying to his friend, she has her own agency, referring to his wife, Shana, at the time. I just need to move on and find someone to be my best friend again. He's saying in a very healthy, non-toxic way, she has the right to leave me. I know we're married and, you know, the temple says we're eternally married and whatever, but she is her own person and she has the right to leave. And now I need to move on and find someone who will be my eternal companion. End of story. And this just goes to show you that you can't throw a blanket statement like, you know, LDS men are toxic over an entire population of people because here's an example of one that is not, that was completely healthy, that ended up having to go through a very, very hard divorce that made his life incredibly difficult and still isn't trying to murder this woman and still is going to find a way to move on and be happy with somebody else. Now, another email that Jared Bridegan sent his friend Mallory urged her to never get divorced because, quote, it's literally the hardest thing I'll ever do. It's emotionally and physically the worst thing in the world to hear your eternal companion just be like, yeah, I'm out. See you later, end quote. So we can see. Jared's upset about this. He doesn't want this to end. He wants to find a way to make it work. He wants to find a way to stay together. She doesn't want to, but instead of being like, oh, she's my eternal companion, she don't have a choice, he's like, hey, it hurts to hear her say that. It's really the hardest thing I'll ever do, but I accept it. And like I said, even after discovering his wife's alleged affair, because I'm only saying alleged because we don't have proof, right? We got a guy saying that it happened and Jared found some stuff, but still, we, we don't have proof. It's just hearsay so far, allegedly. But even after this, Jared was willing to forgive and forget for the sake of their family, but Shanna wanted out. And the day after she filed for divorce, Shanna visited a local tattoo parlor requesting a genital piercing. Now, as I had kind of alluded to earlier, one of the employees of this shop would become friends with Shanna. And he said he was shocked 
when she first walked in and told him what she wanted because he said, you know, she just looked like a regular wholesome mother. But he also said that with each visit to the tattoo parlor, each new tattoo, each new piercing, he noticed that Shanna was getting wilder and wilder. And he said, you know, this woman went from being a goody two-shoes to a wild lady. And he remembered thinking, well, this is a changed woman. Now, this employee, who also wishes to remain anonymous, he remembered having dinner with Shanna at a Jacksonville restaurant called the Flying Iguana. And during this dinner, she made some surprising statements. He said, quote, She had been talking to us about her divorce, and she told us that her life could just be better if he could just shut up, and asked if we knew anybody that could shut him up. I did not take it at the time as anything nefarious. In hindsight, I can see how that can be taken differently now, end quote. And we can't really blame him, right? I've been around people who are getting divorced, um, and there, there's a lot of vitriol. There's a lot of, like, hatred, especially in the beginning when one person feels hurt or one person feels like the other person doesn't want to let them go. There can be a lot of issues. People say things, I hate him, I wish he was dead, it'd be easier if he was dead, stuff like this. And we can't really take that as them making a statement that they are about to have their spouse, you know, killed. But listen, it is something to keep in mind, and I'm glad that this person did. And no divorce is easy, but the Bridegan divorce was especially contentious, including over 300 separate filings and motions. So Shanna said she wanted exclusive occupancy of the couple's home and full custody of their twins, but Jared argued that he deserved custody as well as alimony and child support payments, and he wanted to remain in the family home since he said Shanna had the financial means to live elsewhere. Now, this led to Shanna telling friends that Jared was trying to take all of her money. Like I said, they're all going to be talking to their own friends, their own people, their own support network. They're going to have their claims. They're going to have their declarations. They're going to have their variation and narration of what happened, and that's their own narrative. No side is 100% the truth. I don't think that Jared was trying to take all of Shana's money. I think that he was basically saying, listen, she's got the money to find another place to live for now if we can't live together, so I would like to stay here. And in a way, I suppose I understand that. But it's really not going to be issues about the house or money that cause the biggest problems. It's going to be their children, as is always the case. So in court, Shanna claimed that Jared had threatened to take funds from the twins' trust funds to use for himself. She said he had coached their children to make statements against her. Jared, in turn, accused Shanna of spying on him. And, I mean, I could say he accused her. She definitely was because he wrote an email to his lawyer in which he detailed that Shanna had put a tracker in his vehicle as well as used baby monitors planted in their children's rooms to spy on him. Jared had found one monitor under Abby's dresser and another one under Liam's bed. So obviously here, Shanna's trying to catch him doing something that she can like use against him in court during this custody battle. Very, very messy. And Jared said to his lawyer in an email on May 17th, 2015, quote, this is enough. I should have every damn right on my own property to not constantly be under recording or monitoring by Shanna. I want the flipping gates of hell released on her for this, end quote. And I mean, I agree with him. That would be disgusting to have somebody recording you in your own home without your knowledge. It's a huge boundary violation. It's a huge lack of privacy violation. And I don't blame him for being upset. But like I said, this is what you see in divorces. One person does something, the other person who maybe before was like, I just want to get through this with the least amount of damage possible all of a sudden has to retaliate because at some point the person who's trying to be the good one in the divorce is going to be like well I didn't start this war but I'm not going to sit here defenseless and allow you to continue to attack me and possibly compromise my ability to parent my children. Disagreements continued when Shanna accused Jared of sending her aggressive, condescending, and ineffective text messages, and Jared fired back, claiming that Shanna treated him in a disparaging manner in front of their children. A motion from July of 2015 showed that the two parents could not even agree on where to send their kids to school, and less than a month before the school year started, the twins were still not enrolled anywhere, and obviously this was um, rectified and they were eventually enrolled into school and Shanna and Jared had to you know actually agree on that 
And even after the divorce was finalized and Shanna and Jared were sharing joint custody, issues continued. Shanna wanted Jared to provide her with reasonable information about his travel with their children out of state. She wanted to know his approximate location as well as the approximate time he would be leaving and returning. But Jared refused, which I will say, this is not my marriage, but I will say that's probably a little um, uncooperative. If I was divorced and my spouse was traveling out of the state with my kids and it had been a contentious divorce and the custody had been, you know, really tough as well, I would also want to know where they were going, when they were leaving, when they would be back. That's just because it's your kids. The reasons Shanna wanted to know about Jared's whereabouts may not have been that pure, but still it's completely understandable that she would want to. But when both Shanna and Jared remarried, there were also then arguments about overnight visits and how much exposure the kids would get to each step-parent. And while we're on this subject, let's talk about how Jared and Shanna each found someone new and how they appeared to be moving on with their lives, but they were still battling it out in court against each other. So at the end of 2015, Jared had been offered a job as a user experience designer for a Utah tech startup company called Canopy. According to Nate Sanders, the man who hired him, Jared was an incredibly kind and positive person who was motivated by how much he loved his kids. Sanders said, quote, his focus was on his children. He was worried about Liam. He was worried about Abby. And everything he ever talked about revolved around those two, end quote. But living in a different state obviously posed an issue with custody, and eventually Jared was forced to quit and move back to Florida because he didn't want anything to put his ability to see his children in jeopardy. And obviously, when you're living in Utah and your kids are in Florida, that is going to cause an issue, and somebody like Shanna would use that against him to try to argue like, hey, he's not even here, he doesn't deserve joint custody, I should get sole custody, and he should just get like visitation or something. So... Once Jared moved back to Florida, he expressed the desire to, you know, get back out there, start dating again, and he signed up to a few dating sites. Nate Sanders said that Jared had gone on some dates with a few women he'd met on Tinder and Bumble, but he had not found anyone he could connect with until he matched with a young woman who was living in North Carolina, and she was working for Microsoft, and her name was Kirsten Vach. Jared told Nate that Kirsten was special. He said, you know, this one's different. We have things in common. I could really see this going somewhere. And Kirsten herself said she was immediately drawn to Jared. They got along well. Their communication was easy. They had shared values. They had things in common. It was like they had known each other for much longer. And Kirsten and Jared spent many hours chatting and talking on the phone before he made the six-hour drive to North Carolina for their first date. And a few months after that, Kirsten told her company, Microsoft, that she would be working remote full time. She moved to Florida and she and Jared were married in October of 2017. And it seemed everybody in Jared's life was super happy about this, right? His family, his friends, they were all like, okay, this is the woman that you should have been with the whole time. And sometimes people marry the wrong people and then they find the person that they're supposed to be with. And it seemed that this was the case for Jared and Kirsten, like they were made for each other. And I cannot tell you how sad I am for Kirsten as I went through her Facebook posts that she lost she lost him so soon after finding him. You know, she she had somebody who would be hers forever, who she would love forever, and now he's gone and she's devastated by this. She's devastated by it. In October of 2017, Jared's sister Ashley posted on Facebook that she could not be happier that her brother was getting remarried, especially after all he'd gone through in the past few years, aka Shayna, the divorce, the custody battle, the issues with him, you know, having to go to Utah for a job and then having to come back to Florida and lose that job. And Ashley said, quote, I love that he gets his happy ending with the most beautiful, kind-hearted, sweet, pure girl. Jared always wondered who the Lord would send him and who would want a single dad with two children. He could not have asked for a better girl. Welcome to the family, Kirsten. We will love you forever, end quote. And for a year, Jared and Kirsten lived happily as newlyweds while also spending time trying to figure out a new family dynamic that included Jared's two children. 
the twins, Liam and Abby. And as part of the custody agreement, Jared and Kirsten would get the twins every other week. But on the weeks that he didn't have Abby and Liam, Jared would pick them up on Wednesday nights to have what he called daddy dates, which usually would consist of dinner and a quick activity. And then he would drop them off at their mother's house. And this is specifically because it's like I get them every other week, but I don't want to go a full week without seeing them. And Shanna would do the same thing. So on the weeks that she didn't have the kids, she would go on Wednesdays, pick them up from Jared and Kirsten and take them out to dinner and spend time with them because, you know, they were gone the whole week. And this is the difficult thing about getting divorced. Like you have to face the fact that there's just going to be some days that you don't see your kids when you were used to seeing them every single day. It's honestly very tragic and sad, but it can be made to work. And it seemed like Jared and Shanna were kind of making it work and figuring it out. There should have been no issues. And then in August of 2019, Jared and his new wife, Kirsten, welcomed their first child into the world, and her name was Bexley. By August of 2021, Bexley had a baby sister named London, and Kirsten could not believe how lucky she was to have two beautiful children and a husband who she felt was the best father that she could have ever provided for her children. Kirsten said that Jared was a present and loving father. All of his children were always his top priority, and he was very creative when it came to playtime and using their imaginations. She gave an example. She said, quote, when it was raining, we would make little toothpick boats to float them down the street in the gutter, end quote. And Kirsten saw this before they even had their own children, how Jared would take Abby and Liam and it was never like downtime or just sit in front of the TV while I do what I want. It was like, we're going to make something. We're going to create something. We're going to use our imaginations. We're going to get outside. She loved that about him. His kids loved that about him. Now, Kirsten said during this time, they were all so happy. Like I said, she'd stopped working at Microsoft to be a full-time mother. Jared had started working at Microsoft where he was really enjoying his job. He felt challenged. He was thriving. He liked his coworkers. They liked him. He and Kirsten had a happy home. They had a great circle of friends and a loving support system. But they had no idea behind the scenes their happy ending was not going to happen. And something very nefarious was brewing. Shanna Gardner had also gotten remarried in 2018 to Mario Fernandez. This was a man she'd met at a CrossFit gym where he worked as a maintenance man, and they were married that same year. I would not be able to tell you anything about their relationship. It's it, There's really nothing out there about it, obviously, because Shanna and Mario are not talking. They've both been arrested for murder, and they're not going to talk about their love story and how they met. There's really not a lot to say what drew her to him, and some have speculated that maybe Shanna married Mario specifically so she could, you know, set him up for the murder of her ex-husband, Jared. Now, Shanna and Mario did not have any children of their own, but it was very likely that Shana was watching Jared's love story unfold and evolve. She was watching his friends and family talk about Kirsten like, you know, she was the second coming of Christ and Shanna's over here thinking in her entitled, unself-aware way, like, well, I was a good wife. How dare they? I gave him two children. They never talked about me like this on Facebook. And uh, what's wrong with me? And, you know, they're trying to make this seem like it's all my fault. It's not all my fault. She's lying to herself and she's making it seem like, you know, this was not something that she initiated, not something she wanted. And maybe she wasn't as happy in her own marriage and maybe she became annoyed by his happiness and maybe she started to think like, yo, it's me. Hi, I'm the problem, it's me. I wasn't happy with Jared. I'm not happy with Mario. Maybe I just can't be happy. Maybe I'm the problem. And then instead of allowing that thought to process and, you know, congeal in her brain, she was like, no, 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 no. It's Jared's fault. He's the problem. I'm angry with him, and now I have to um, take that anger out. Now, after Jared was killed, Shayna publicly stated that she had not been involved. She knew nothing about what had happened to him, and she was devastated by this. As her innocence has come into question, Shanna Gardner spoke to me in the only TV interview she says she'll be doing to tell her side of the story. I do want people to understand you know, where I'm coming from. Almost five months after Jared Bridegan was murdered in the street in front of his two-year-old daughter, we spoke with his ex-wife, who has not commented publicly so far. Our first question, why have you stayed silent? I was asked to not talk to the media or give a public statement, but with the level of speculation, I felt that now it was necessary to to speak out. Shanna Gardner revealed she was asked by Jared Breidigan's widow, Kirsten, not to speak publicly, but we wanted to know how the relationship could have gotten to that point. I'm sure they, you would say that we've had 
happy moments. I mean, we share the two most beautiful children in the world. In 2015, Jared and Shanna divorced. Their court records, which we obtained from the St. Johns County court system, revealed a long, complicated process lasting over five years. Anytime divorce comes into any situation, it's messy. It just is. I will say that I think that we both love our kids. Jared and Shanna both wanted full custody. The court file details allegations of spying, deceit, and more. In the end, Shanna and Jared reached an agreement. They shared custody, and whenever the children were at one parent's house, the other would come over Wednesday and have a date night. That's exactly what Jared and his twins did the night he was killed. It was actually one of the, one of the things, I'm sorry. Um, I remember my son tucking him in and him saying that it was a good date night. But that happiness would end just minutes after leaving Shanna's house just over two miles from her home. In a quiet neighborhood with few security cameras, a tire was rolled out into the street. Jared got out of his car to move it and was shot dead. His two-year-old daughter sat in the car, strapped into her car seat alone for three minutes before someone came to help. I was shocked. Um, I fell to the floor because I was devastated um, for what I was going to have to tell my kids. Jared died in that street, leaving behind four children and a heartbroken family. They were, I think, in shock. Later, in a blog post, Shanna's mother said she was not invited to the funeral. I asked Shanna about the situation. His family did not invite me or want me there. But the day before a vigil hosted by Jared's widow at Celebration Park, Shanna was photographed at the park with her kids by the tabloid Daily Mail. Talk about a violation of privacy, because my kids know that they were photographed and they were worried. The tabloid presented the facts in a way that leave room for speculation about Shanna having a role in Jared's death, citing their rocky divorce papers and her absence from the funeral. Even though we didn't always get along, he was still the father of my kids. So I asked Shanna the question. Did you have anything to do with Jared's murder? No, I did not have anything to do with his murder. Shanna says she has no idea if the murder was targeted or what Jared was involved in, saying they ran in different circles. But Action News Jax reported in June, Shanna had hired criminal defense attorney Hank Cox. He was referred to me by several friends, and ultimately, my kids' images and videos were being used in the media without consent. Shanna said Cox was hired to protect her kids. I asked her if she thinks she will face criminal charges. She says no, that she's cooperated with detectives. Do you have any idea who might have done this? I do not have any idea. I, as I said, we've been divorced. We don't run in the same social circles. I, all I know is that I would never want anybody to go through this. She told me if she could speak to Jared again, she'd say one thing. Honestly, that I wish it weren't like this. I wish things could, could have been and could be different. And Shanna told me despite this happening in her neighborhood, despite many people around her discussing the case, she has no intention of leaving Jack's Beach or Jacksonville. So there's a lot to unpack in that clip. First of all, when Shanna said that if she could talk to Jared again, she would tell him that she wished things hadn't gone this way. I believe she's being honest. But that may be the only place that she's being honest. That may be where her honesty ends. I truly believe that after Jared died, and she had some time to think about what had happened, she realized like, oh, I had the father of my children murdered. He, he was a good father too. Maybe Mario's not such a good father figure, but Jared was a good father and I took that away from my children. Oh, I'm actually kind of sad because I do think she was a little sad about it because you can see she's crying. I think she's a little, a little sad. Like I don't think she realized the implications of what she was doing until it was done and he was gone. And maybe she's like, I'm actually a little sad about this. I wish things hadn't gone this way. But it almost also feels like, you know, Jared, I would tell you that if you just behaved yourself and done what I wanted and gone along with everything that my spoiled brat entitled brain wanted, because that's how I grew up, being handed everything, being given everything I wanted and never being told no, if you just gone along with what I wanted, this wouldn't have had to happen. She also mentions not being invited to Jared's funeral and therefore she and the twins did not attend. So she didn't let her own children 
Jared's children go to his funeral, and instead they opted to organize their own memorial service for Jared weeks later. And then on a blog that Shanna's mother, Sherry, wrote online, we're going to talk about this blog in a minute too, but Sherry wrote that Shanna had been purposely left out, although Kirsten had offered to pick up Abby and Liam so that they could say goodbye to their father. And it's like, yeah, Shanna was not invited to the funeral because by the time the funeral happened, like, definitely Kirsten and Jared's family, his brother Adam, like, all of these people definitely knew that Shanna was involved in some way, shape, or form with the death of Jared. So why would she be invited to the funeral? Additionally, Shanna had hired a defense attorney, Henry Cox III, who was the former president of the Florida Bar. But she said she hadn't done this because she was guilty or because she had anything to hide. She'd done this to protect the privacy of her children, claiming that the intense media coverage had become very loud and her kids were feeling unsafe. She said, quote, my kids are 10. They understand everything that is going on. They see this and they are scared, terrified, and struggling, end quote. I think that Shanna was scared, terrified, and struggling because I think she knew they were on to her. I don't think that she understood that as soon as he died, people were going to look at the context and be like, mm, it kind of looks like you were involved, Shanna, because this dude had no enemies. This was an ambush. Somebody would have had to know his schedule, know what route he took home, know where he would be that night. And all roads lead to you. I don't think she knew that people would be as immediately suspicious as they were. And so she was really afraid that she was going to get caught. And it also wasn't necessarily true that Shanna was not going to be leaving Jacksonville Beach, Florida. Remember, she says, oh, no matter the scrutiny I'm under and what pressure is put on me, I'm not leaving. No, seven months after Jared's murder, Shanna and the twins moved to West Richland, Washington. And they began living in a $1 million home purchased by her parents' company. Mario Fernandez, Shanna's husband, was significantly missing from this move. And in the months following her ex-husband's shocking and surprising murder, Shanna's behavior raised a few eyebrows. Within weeks of Jared's death, Shanna emailed Kirsten Bride again, Jared's wife, and asked her to return some library books that the twins had borrowed. And in a separate email, Shanna requested a copy of Jared's death certificate, claiming that her lawyer needed it for family court. And Kirsten didn't respond to this email, rightly so, because it's like, are you serious, lady? But she did tell a local news outlet, quote, I was like, who does this? This is so evil. Here I am planning a funeral, and she's asking for a death certificate? End quote. Five weeks after Jared's murder, Shanna, her husband Mario, and the twins took a trip with Shanna's parents. And on her blog, Shelly Gardner, who remembers Shanna's mother, she posted multiple pictures of them all having a great time sipping frozen cocktails, hanging out in the pool, going to dinner. And Shelly wrote on her blog, quote, for spring break, we drove with Shanna and her family to Club Med Sandpiper Bay, an all-inclusive resort in Florida. It reminded us of a cruise, only on land. It was so much fun, end quote. This is five weeks after Jared is shot to death in the street. They decide to take a vacation. Now listen, people grieve differently. It's true. But that's a little insensitive don't you think? For many months while police investigated, it appeared that there was very little movement in this case besides the release of pictures of a truck. Because after Jared had been shot, law enforcement watched surveillance videos of the area and they saw a dark colored Ford F-150 on a bunch of this footage. And they put a picture out of this truck and they're like, has anybody seen this truck? Does anybody know who owns this truck? It appeared to have tan or brown running boards and it was determined to be a 2004 or 2008 model with a silver toolbox and Jacksonville Beach police detectives told the public that the vehicle may have been involved in the murder of Jared Bridegan. But that was all we got. We really didn't know what was going on. And suddenly, during a press conference recently, Jacksonville Beach police chief Gene Paul Smith and state's attorney Melissa Nelson announced that an arrest had been made in the case. On January 25th, 2023, 61-year-old Henry Arthur Tenen was charged with conspiracy to commit murder, second-degree murder with a weapon, accessory after the fact to a capital felony, and child abuse. According to his court file, on or between January 4th, 2022 and February 16th, 2022, he did agree to conspire or confederate with others to affect the death of Jared Bridegan. State Attorney Melissa Nelson openly stated during the press conference, quote, Quote, we know Henry Tenen did not act alone, end quote. In response to this arrest and information, Kirsten Bridegan said, quote, It's pretty clear that someone knew his route, his schedule. 
I felt since the beginning that this was planned. This was thought out and this was specific to Jared. So I'm not surprised that they announced about Henry Tenen, someone that we have never heard of and Jared didn't know. And he wasn't alone in this, end quote. Maybe Kirsten and Jared Bridegan's family had never heard of Henry Tenen, but he was known to someone connected to Jared, and that someone was Mario Fernandez, Shanna's husband. Tenen had once lived in a house owned by Mario in northwest Jacksonville, and Mario had issued three checks to Henry Tenen in 2022. On top of that, it appeared there were multiple communications, more than 70 interactions between the two men between February and June of 2022. In February alone, there had been 35 calls, and legal experts feel that these calls could show that there was preparation and planning going into the murder of Jared Bridegan, premeditation, if you will, since Henry Tenen would later confess to police that he was the shooter, and it appeared that he had known information about Jared, such as the type of vehicle he drove, his schedule, and the route he'd be taking after leaving Shanna's house. On March 16th, 2023, Mario Fernandez was also arrested. And on this same day, Henry Tenen pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. He took a plea deal with the understanding that he would testify against the others involved, even though he reportedly was the person who pulled the trigger. In exchange for his testimony, the state agreed to drop three of Tenor's charges, which were the conspiracy to commit murder, accessory after the fact, and child abuse. And this child abuse charge was in regards to Jared's two-year-old daughter, Bexley, being in the SUV at the time of his murder. Those bullets entering the vehicle that Bexley was in, those bullets could have struck her, so he had a child abuse charge. And these are the same charges that Mario Fernandez is going to face. And then also the same charges that Shanna Gardner is going to face because on August 17th, after a grand jury indicted her on these same charges, Shanna was arrested in West Richland, Washington at her million dollar house that her parents bought for her and the process of extraditing her back to Florida began. And once she arrived in Florida, Shanna pleaded not guilty, of course, and then she hired Jose Baez to represent her. Now, although Henry Tenen will be sentenced to 15 years to life, the state of Florida has made their intentions to seek the death penalty for Shanna and her husband, Mario. And we're all very familiar with Jose Baez on this channel, along with his roster of shady clients ranging from Casey Anthony to Aaron Hernandez and I think Harvey Weinstein. So it's no surprise that Baez would take on a client such as Shana Gardner, who he claims is completely innocent, which I mean, like, yeah, everyone's innocent until proven guilty, but come on. Come on right now. Like, are we serious? Uh, she's not completely innocent, Jose. Allegedly. Just my opinion. Don't come for me. But Jose Baez says not only is his client completely 100% innocent, the government's trying to kill her because he's dramatic like that. Your, your first thoughts on this first appearance and what Shanna Gardner is going through? Well, she's going through an obvious uh, difficult time. Uh, she's never experienced anything like this and contrary to what some people may believe based on what occurred in court today she's never been in trouble with the, with the law before uh, and to be charged with something so uh, horrific and, and so serious where there's the government is trying to uh, for, for all in, intents and purposes kill you uh, it, it would rattle anyone and uh, she's certainly no exception what is some of your strategy in this case, albeit at the early stages? Um, the state says that they have nearly 100 witnesses and seven terabytes of electronic data. What is your strategy to handle that? And uh, well, you got to read it. Uh, so uh, it, I'm absolutely certain, without an inkling of a doubt, that there's not going to be 100 witnesses in this case. Uh, that's very common. Uh, many times, it's their obligation to inform the number of people who might have information. And that's really all that is. So I, I think you don't want to read too much into that. And and um, our government can burn a lot of paper. So that's where the seven terabytes probably comes from. The state wants to charge Ms. Gardner along with Mr. Fernandez jointly. Is it your belief that they should be charged separately based on her potential not guiltiness? Well, I'm not a fan, uh, generally speaking, of, of trying people together. I think everybody should have their day in court and that day should be individual uh, and specific to them. So um, I, I would say that about any case that, that, uh, that I'm not a fan of that. So I don't, I don't interpret this any differently. What holes do you plan on 
punching in the state's case at this point. Is, is there something that you're aware of that points directly to her innocence in this case? Well, she's innocent, so that that's that's number one. And as, as far as what strategies, I, as you heard, I haven't even gotten the discovery yet, so I couldn't even comment, nor would I even if I did. Fair so, enough. all right. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. So I hate to admit it, but I have to be fair and unbiased, and I do agree with Jose Baez on one thing. <laughs> unbiased. Jose Baez. I'm unbiased. He's biased. Baez. I'm sorry. Anyways, I'm not a fan of combining the trials of two defendants. I'm really not. And everyone does deserve their own day in court, even though he makes it sound like it's something special, like everybody deserves the, their favorite and best wedding day. You know, that's how he's kind of making it seem. Like, actually, at this point... The reason they're probably trying to try Mario and Shanna together is because Mario and Shanna had entwined themselves together as far as communications. They hired the same defense attorney even before they were arrested or charged with anything. They have both the same motive for wanting to see Jared gone. Those are probably the reasons they want to try these people together. But I do think that everybody deserves their own trial. And I don't think it's a bad idea to try and turn Mario against Shanna because it seems that Shanna is trying to distance herself from Mario and it's very likely that she and her lawyers are going to attempt to pin this entire thing on him which is probably why Jose Baez wants their trial separated. We also heard Jose Baez talk about how the state claims to have seven terabytes of data as far as evidence in this case. And we're gonna talk about exactly what that means in a minute. Because first we have to talk about a 63 page motion filed by Mario's legal team, Mario Fernandez's legal team. And his defense attorneys have asked the judge to disqualify the state's attorney's office and Melissa Nelson from prosecuting Jared Bridegan's murder case. According to these lawyers, the state's attorney's office has too much information. <laughs> I'm sorry, it just sounds funny. Like, they have way too much evidence, okay? We cannot have them prosecuting him with all this evidence they have. Anyways, the lawyers say... The state's attorney's office, they have too much information, which includes emails and text messages. But it's not just information. It's that this information should be confidential and some of it should be covered under attorney-client privilege. Mario Fernandez's lawyers say the state attorney's office has too much information, emails and texts that should be confidential and could potentially compromise the fairness of the case. That's the basis of this 63-page motion which defense attorneys filed in Duval County Court yesterday. That was in response to this. It's a 23-page list from the state showing the evidence that they have on the case. Prosecutors have statements from dozens of witnesses, including people who provided surveillance video. There are jail calls from the Duval County Jail and Washington State, where Gardner was arrested. Investigators have Jared Bridegan's computer, also video of his funeral. Additionally, there are the cell phones of Fernandez and Gardner and conversations that authorities got through wiretaps. How does a wiretap in a criminal case like this work? So a wiretap is um, it's one of the most intrusive investigative techniques. Uh, there's a high threshold for obtaining a wiretap. In fact, you have to go before a judge. Tony Krabbit is a former FBI supervisor who now runs the Risk Confidence Group. She says wiretaps require warrants and are done very carefully according to federal law. You have to show that you have tried um, all types of other investigative means and that you were unable to establish, you know, gain the information that you're going to need. And you also have to show that there is a high likelihood that using a wiretap, you will be able to gain that information. And it's really important to note that, you know, you only in a, in a wiretap, you only have 30 days. Krabbit says it's likely the defense will push back against some of the communications intercepted in the wiretaps, including those with the suspect's lawyers. In an email, a state attorney's office spokesperson told us the state will file appropriate objections to the defendant's motion and is confident it will prevail after full consideration by the court. In this case, investigators used a third-party team not affiliated with the case 
to remove any privileged information. We know that the Secret Service was involved with what's called a taint team. A taint team is, is just that, that you don't want to taint your investigation. The defense claims that necessary redactions did not happen. Ultimately, the judge will make a decision on whether the case will get a new team of prosecutors from a different district. So because there's such a large amount of evidence in this case, digital evidence even specifically, a next point portal was created to store it all, an electronic portal. And reportedly it took months to create this portal. The defense team wasn't even given access to it until October 20th, at which point they claimed they were shocked to learn how the state's attorney's office planned to use attorney-client privileged communications, including 66 emails exchanged between Shana Gardner and her lawyers. There was also a phone call between Shana and her lawyer in Washington state that was available in the next point portal. And Mario's defense team claims that at least 28 people were given access to this portal. And it's a whole big deal. Let me see if they've updated anything about this, by the way, and, and made a ruling on this yet, because they're definitely trying to um, delay this. They are trying to delay this trial. And I just can't see how the state's attorney's office would have anything like that obviously illegal that they then gave the defense attorneys access to so that they could get disqualified. You know, like why would they do that. Now, there was a team brought in to redact everything that was sensitive information, and perhaps that team was not, a, you know, as efficient as they should have been. I don't know, but let's see. Yeah, there's nothing new at this point. It says a so-called taint team was initially created to redact privileged communications, but the defense claims that the state's attorney's office continued to use privileged information, such as a document titled Confidential Communications. The state's attorney's office has insisted the document was not confidential, and the defense was denied access, according to the motion. Furthermore, the defense lawyer said, quote, the state's attorney's office did nothing to prevent the mass distribution of communications clearly protected by attorney-client privilege, end quote. The defense says in Florida, courts have consistently disqualified prosecutors who have violated attorney-client privilege, and it cited other cases. Now, it says Judge London Kite, who's presiding over the case, will decide whether to recuse the Fourth Judicial Circuit State's Attorney's Office. If that's the case, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will appoint a special prosecutor from a different circuit. The closest circuits are Daytona Beach, Gainesville, and Orlando. A spokesperson for the State's Attorney's Office has said, quote, the state will file appropriate objections to the defendant's motion and is confident it will prevail after full consideration by the court, end quote. It's very likely that the defense attorneys for Mario Fernandez are exaggerating how bad these communications are and the state's attorney's office did everything right i doubt they would do anything that wrong that would compromise this case but either way both shanna gardner and mario fernandez will appear together in court for the first time together during the next hearing which is scheduled for december 1st before we wrap this up i want to talk about what i think to be the most important takeaway from this case which is jared's daughter bexley who was two years old when she was helplessly forced to watch as her father was gunned down before her very eyes Obviously, no matter the age of the child, something like this is going to be so, so incredibly traumatic, especially when the kids are not yet at an age where they can understand complex concepts such as death. I want it to be safe, so I will protect Mama. For Kirsten Brightigan, it's these moments Nobody can hurt you. I love you. that dig into her heart, already hurting from grief. Her daughter now worried about her mother's safety after she witnessed her father's murder six months ago. She was only two and a half at the time, and Brightigan says some days she understands her father is gone, but other days she talks about looking forward to seeing him come home. And that's excruciating because I have to go back and explain, no honey, like dad's not going to be there. His body got hurt, dad died, and then it just like starts all over. But Kirsten Brightigan wants to make sure Jared's story isn't forgotten, creating an Instagram, Justice for Jared B, and speaking to news outlets across the nation, but always in the back of her mind, the fear. But there is a part of me that does worry about me being so vocal and me fighting so much that they could try to hurt me or Bexley because Bexley was there. Daddy, I moved your flower. 
I see it. That's a beautiful flower. She says another tragedy in the midst of her husband's murder is that people now remember him for how he died and not the man and father that he was to his twins from his first marriage and his two children with her. Um, so he would spend countless hours just making up activities to do together. He wrote jokes in their lunch every single day when they went to school. <laughs> He's just a, a quality guy who cared about the people in his life. It's a sentiment echoed by Jared Bridegan's brother, Adam. And in many regards, I looked up to him as a father and as a husband, just the way that he treated not only Kirsten, but his, his kids. I, I know I was able to watch him and learn from him as far as how he treated them. The list goes on as far as how many lives have been shattered by this tragedy. And all of us are suffering and we live in this fear and there is no accountability yet. There are no answers. We need those answers. Answers that will help Kirsten Bridegan get through these tough moments. What do you hope the next six months bring? I hope it brings justice. I hope that those who were involved in his murder are caught. I hope that we can get to a trial quickly. Um, I, I just hope that there's a resolution and that I can answer Bexley when she asks me why. So Kirsten Bridegan hoping to find a silver lining to a loss that was so earth shattering for herself, for her children and for Jared's other two children. She basically <laughs> made something out of nothing. She made a bright light out of a completely, you know, tragic situation. And she created something called Bexley Boxes. Bexley Bridegan witnessed the unimaginable on this stretch of roadway. She was taken to the Jacksonville Beach Police Department. But all officers had to comfort her was a coloring book, some crayons, and this little plush police toy. In thinking back on Bexley's experience that night, Kirsten Bridegan says she thought of a way she could help. And hence, the Bexley Box was born. Daddy, the love is undeniable. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful. It's a great picture, Daddy. Between Bexley flower. and her dad. I see it. That's a beautiful flower. So losing him in front of her, then being surrounded by strangers, bright lights, and sirens, was a lot for little Bexley to try and process. You know, as a mother, you want to do everything you can for your child. And while the officers did their best with what they had, I had wished that there was more, more to distract her, more snacks that she was familiar with and liked, you know, a sippy cup. I decided, like, we can make a difference for other kids, and it would help Bexley and I kind of work through some of those things together and, and give us an outlet for some of the grief that we're going through. The idea then moved into a post on Instagram. So I've decided to create Bexley boxes. Pointing towards a registry of diapers, toys for various ages, formula, snacks, and other items to fill the first Bexley box. The response was overwhelming. It was like box upon box and box, and Bexley got so excited to open the door and just like bring them all in and unpack them and organize them. It was incredible. Kirsten says she was blown away by the generosity. Entire Target registry has been purchased. And the response from law enforcement that the need for something like a Bexley box is there. She says it gave her a way to focus her thoughts and energy on something that would honor Jared's legacy, even in the midst of the pain. There's still grief. But we're learning how to live with it and kind of shift the energy that goes towards the sadness into something more positive, like what can we do with this? Um, rather than just wallowing in it, like let's, let's shift that energy and that focus somewhere else. And that's where the Bexley boxes are coming from. The first Bexley box going to the Jacksonville Beach Police Department. A full circle moment for Kirsten, Bexley, and the officers that were with them that night. As the donations continued to come in, Kirsten and members of Jared's family established the Bridegan Foundation with the goal of providing a Bexley box full of comfort items and necessities for children to any police station or sheriff's office that needs one. They've delivered multiple Bexley boxes around our area and even one to a police station in Texas. 
Sergeant Tater says the Bexley box at Jacksonville Beach has already helped children that have had to spend time at the station. And she is continually impressed with the strength Kirsten has shown over the last year. Very, very amazed with her strength that she's reached deep down and she's found that. She's tried to turn uh, this horrific event in her life and that of, of her children um, into something, you know, to, to make something positive out of this horrible event. So for, for her to move forward and say, let's do something good, I think is great. I, I'm very proud of her for going that direction rather than, you know, I've seen it go other directions um, or people just go downhill, but she's kept moving forward for her kids and for the memory of Jared, and um, I think it's great what she's doing. I know you'd be really proud that we are doing something good, that we are helping other people. Jared was always about that. You know, he was, he was kind of shy <clears throat> and a little bit soft-spoken until you got to know him, then he was a goofball. Um, but he really genuinely enjoyed helping people. And so I think he'd be really proud of this and proud that um, we would have a part in, in something positive, that his death wouldn't, wouldn't just be negative, it wouldn't be the, the tragedy, it would be there's something good coming from that. And I think that would bring him some peace. Now, I am not too proud to say that when I watched this news story, that I just played a clip for you. Um, I cried like a baby, just in the dark by myself, just cried. And it is, I mean, it's just hard to believe that somebody can push forward the way Kirsten has in the face of this unimaginable tragedy. It's really, but, but admirable, right? Like, I don't know if I could do it, um, especially not that soon. She's done something amazing and these Bexley boxes are very important and are needed for law enforcement agencies. It's an amazing idea and I'm surprised nobody's come up with it before now. But maybe that was part of Bexley and Kirsten's calling in life. Maybe this was for them to do because Jared would be so incredibly proud of his wife and children right now. So incredibly proud. So I am going to actually put a link for you to check out more about the Baxley boxes. You can donate if you feel so moved to do that. Oh, Baxley is so adorable. Oh my God. It says, with your help, we can provide and maintain the refillable Baxley boxes in every police department across the country. Please join us in our mission to comfort children during what is likely the worst moments of their lives. Ugh, so sad. So I will put a link in the description box as well as a link for the Bright Again Foundation website so that you guys can check it out. And if you want to donate or if you want to just know more, if you want to see if there's something else you can do, you know, you can send things. It doesn't just have to be money. You can send things. Um, this is, it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. So check that out. Um, yeah. And keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Keep Kirsten and her children and Jared's other two children, Abby and Liam, in your thoughts and prayers. These are four children who lost what, you know, appeared to be. Like, I don't know these people, but from what I can see, from everything I've read, Jared was an amazing father that any kid would be lucky to have as a father. And now he's gone. And for what reason? What was the motive? Well, we'll hopefully find out more about that, even though Shanna Gardner is claiming to be not guilty, but we will find out more about what her motive is or could have been when we get to a trial. But overall, I would say her motive was probably either wanting complete control and custody of the children or jealousy and resentment that Jared had moved on with his life, that he was doing better than ever, that he had a glow up as far as, you know, his personal life went and even his work life was going well. And she realized, oh, hey, I lured him with my parents' money but actually, money's not all that important. Love is important. Support is important. A loving, supportive, caring partner can make all the difference more than millions of dollars can. And she just couldn't stand that. So let me know what you think in the comment section. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't already. We'd love to have you here. Comment in the comment section. Let me know what you think. Did I say like already? Like it if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. Yeah, that, I covered it. So until next time, and I'll be back very soon. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe. And I'll see you very, very, very soon. Let's get it.
loving you slowly That's all you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings 